Welcome back, clinical problem solvers. It's Prof. Rez, a clinician in Chicago who loves learning and teaching medicine. This channel is dedicated to understanding medicine, and it's purely for your education. Robbie and I are very excited to share our approach to false hypoxemia. But before we can talk about our approach, we first need to identify a few terms and then discuss the beautiful physiology of oxygenation. What's the difference between hypoxemia and hypoxia? Hypoxemia is based on a measurement of the arterial blood gas and reflects the partial pressure of oxygen dissolved in the blood. Hypoxia, I wish they would change this term to cellular hypoxia because hypoxia refers to your cells not having adequate oxygen molecules to undergo aerobic metabolism. You can't directly measure hypoxia, but you can infer it from an elevated lactate because when your cells don't have oxygen, they shift to anaerobic metabolism. Can you have hypoxia without hypoxemia? Absolutely. Imagine someone who is in shock and can't deliver enough blood to the cells so the cells won't get enough oxygen. The blood that's being delivered has a normal PaO2, but the cells are just not seeing enough oxygen. This can also happen in the setting of anemia and abnormal hemoglobin molecule. We'll discuss both of, both of those shortly. I know when you look at this whiteboard, it's quite intimidating. We have an equation, we have this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, but don't be intimidated. We will go through each step and we will understand the physiology of oxygenation. We first have to start with this equation. The content of arterial oxygen, meaning the oxygen available in the blood to reach the cells to prevent cellular hypoxia, depends on three variables. The hemoglobin, the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, and the partial pressure of oxygen. Something that's striking by this formula is this right here, that this partial pressure of oxygen only accounts for 3% of the total oxygen in the blood, while the hemoglobin and the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin accounts for 97%. So now let's define each of these variables and say and, and discuss what affects them. Let's start with the PaO2 the partial pressure of oxygen. And we have this graphic right here, which shows that the PaO2, meaning what gets dissolved in the blood, only depends on the oxygen at the level of the alveoli and the ability of the oxygen to diffuse into the blood vessel and the lack of any shunts. So any cause of true hypoxemia will affect the partial pressure of oxygen. You can refer back to our video on true hypoxemia and you'll understand what can affect the partial pressure of oxygen, which is what's measured on the arterial blood gas. What, what the partial pressure of oxygen is not affected by is the number of hemoglobin or the shape of hemoglobin. This has no effect on the partial pressure of oxygen. And this is why a patient with anemia or a low hemoglobin number will have a normal partial pressure of oxygen, will have a normal oxygen saturation, but may have cellular hypoxia because they can't deliver enough oxygen molecules due to the lack of hemoglobin. Let's now talk about the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. And in order to do that, we first have to distinguish SAO2 versus SPO2. SPO2 is based on the pulse ox. And I remember that, here's the P, pulse ox. So this is a measurement based on the pulse ox. You're not actually sampling the blood. The SAO2, you actually sample the blood to determine the percent oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin molecule. As a reminder, hemoglobin is a protein. It's in red blood cells. It has four iron molecules. Each of these iron can bind an oxygen molecule. So this is measuring the percentage of these binding sites that are bound by the oxygen molecule. 
you can actually directly measure the oxygen saturation of the hemoglobin molecule with cooximetry, meaning you're actually measuring it, you're not calculating it. The problem with calculating it is that this nomogram of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve makes a few assumptions about the temperature, the pH, the CO2, and it assumes that there isn't carboxyhemoglobin or methemoglobin. So you're making all those assumptions when you determine this O2 sat from the blood. So now you understand the difference between hypoxemia and hypoxia. We said that the SpO2 is based on a measurement, the pulse ox using different wavelengths of light. And we talked about how the content of oxygen is primarily determined by the number of hemoglobin molecules and the percent saturation of those hemoglobin molecules. And the percent saturation can either be estimated on the ABG or can actually be measured on an ABG with cooximetry. So now we're ready to talk about false hypoxemia. So you take a pulse ox, you put it on a patient's finger, and you see that the oxygen saturation is low. This can actually reflect true hypoxemia, meaning that this will be low, the PaO2 will be low, the O2 sat, even measured by cooximetry, will be low. And we always work under this assumption until proven otherwise in a patient. But you can easily see how you can have false hypoxemia. One of these buckets is easy to understand. If we have the pulse ox on the finger, anything that interferes with the pulse ox will result in a falsely low oxygen level. I like to refer to this category as false hypoxia. Since you're having false hypoxemia, the interference is just giving you a false measurement, but your cells are not seeing inadequate oxygen. What can result in this? How about if you had nail polish? Or what if your hands were cold? My hands are always cold and you have peripheral vasoconstriction, cold hands. Or what if the device wasn't working? So malfunctioning device. All of these result in false hypoxemia because the device can't accurately shine the infrared and red light to determine the SpO2. This is the bucket that's most fascinating and where all of the legwork is gonna make sense. Can you have false hypoxemia, meaning this device not accurately measuring the SpO2, but have true hypoxia? Of course, but if you couldn't, I wouldn't make this additional category. So for this category, this is when we're in our abnormal hemoglobins, and we'll explain what, I, what we mean by this. For example, methemoglobinemia, soft hemoglobinemia, and even other hemoglobin variants. So what happens here? This, let's just talk about methemoglobin as our example. Methemoglobin absorbs the light from the pulse ox like deoxyhemoglobin. So if the pulse ox is giving you an SpO2 based on oxyhemoglobin over oxy plus deoxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin absorbs light like deoxyhemoglobin. So the pulse ox if you have a more deoxy, it's gonna come up with a low value. Let's say 85%. In fact, methemoglobin anemia never causes it to go below 85%. How does the methemoglobin anemia result in true cellular hypoxia? Well, we, we have to come back to this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. The methemoglobin is holding onto oxygen tighter and when it gets to the cell, it doesn't release oxygen to the cell, resulting in cellular hypoxia. So methemoglobin absorbs the light wavelength like deoxyhemoglobin, dropping the SpO2. It shifts this curve to the left, making hemoglobin hold on to that oxygen tighter. As a consequence, you have cellular hypoxia because hemoglobin is such an important determinant of the content of arterial oxygenation. How can you make that determination based on the ABG and the SpO2? This is what we refer to as the oxygen saturation gap, meaning 
if you take the SaO2 and subtract it from the SpO2, will there be a difference of greater than five? Well, we already know that the SpO2 in methemoglobinemia may reflect 85% based on it absorbing deoxyhemoglobin. The SaO2, the, the, the SaO2 on the ABG is determined by the PaO2. In methemoglobinemia, we already said that the quantity or the shape of hemoglobin doesn't affect PaO2. So the SaO2 is normal, 97%. 97% minus 85 equals 12%. So this gap is a clue to an abnormal hemoglobin. In reality, you may have some concern for methemoglobinemia based on how the blood looks, like that chocolate auger blood, or if the patient re received a medication that induces oxidative stress. But these are other ways you can get to this diagnosis. You may ask Reza, where is carbon monoxide on all of this? Carbon monoxide, folks, is something critical to consider in the right patient who has exposure. And carbon monoxide absorbs light like oxyhemoglobin. So the SpO2 will be normal in carbon monoxide despite having cellular hypoxia. Um, and the way to determine carboxyhemoglobin and even methemoglobin anemia objectively is to send the cooximetry with arterial blood gas. The cooximeter, unlike the pox ox, can shine different wavelengths to actually distinguish carboxy from met from normal hemoglobin. To summarize, there is a difference between hypoxemia and hypoxia that's not pedantic. This refers to cells not getting enough oxygen. This refers to the PaO2. The major determinant of the content of oxygen in the blood is the hemoglobin, both quantity and its ability to release oxygen and the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. On an arterial blood gas, the oxygen saturation is determined by the PaO2 and it's making assumptions which may not be true, temperature, pH, lack of methemoglobinemia, lack of carboxyhemoglobinemia. The pulse ox measures the SpO2 based on two wavelengths and it can only distinguish oxyhemoglobin from deoxyhemoglobin. Methemoglobin is picked up as deoxyhemoglobin giving a low SpO2, but because it doesn't affect the PaO2, you get a normal O2 sat on the arterial blood gas, giving you an oxygen saturation gap of greater than five. Carbon monoxide acts as oxyhemoglobin, so it does not give you a low SpO2. Ultimately, if you have concern for these conditions, carboxy or methemoglobinemia, send a cooximetry with the arterial blood gas. I hope you enjoyed today's session, and um, Robbie and I are always thrilled to inspire you to learn more. It's not about the content, it's about motivating you to understand medicine, to be excited about medicine. Thank you for your time.